Recently, CSS has been cranking out tons of new features that radically change how we write CSS. I mean, just look at some of this code over here and you'll see that there's some crazy CSS being done. In this video, I wanna share with you five new CSS concepts that are either already in browsers or coming very soon that change how you're gonna write CSS. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And there are so many new features to talk about. And my favorite one I'm saving until the very end because it's kind of complex, that this first one is scoping and it's a relatively simple concept to understand in CSS. Essentially, imagine we have this HTML where we have this title here, then we have a card which also contains a title and then a body which contains a title inside that card as well. Well, imagine that the title for my article should be green, as you can see over here, but I want the titles inside my card here to show up as red. Normally, if we want to do that in CSS, we could just select our card and then we could select the title elements inside of it. We can say that their color is going to be red. If I save, you can see that now the title of the card and the body title in the card have changed to red, while the title out here has not been affected at all. Now, this is normal CSS selector hierarchies that you're all used to, but if you're more used to working in a component structure, like something like Astro, React, Svelte, Vue, you may be used to the idea of scoped CSS, where essentially your CSS is scoped to a particular component inside of React or Astro, or whatever framework you're using. And having this scoped CSS makes it really easy for you to write your CSS so you don't have to worry about styles leaking out to other places. For example, here, this title here, I don't have to worry about this title style leaking out anywhere else. I can just refer to it as Dot title and it's going to work just fine without leaking out everywhere. And that's where the at scope property comes in for CSS. So we can come in here with an at scope property, just like this. And inside of the parentheses for this, we mention the element we want to scope this to. In our case, we're scoping to the card element. And then we can write all the CSS we want inside of here as normal with any selectors that we want. Now you can see when I save, I get the same results as I did before. And that's because it's taking all the CSS inside of here and it's only applying it to the elements within this card element. The really great thing about this is I can actually just say, you know what, I'm gonna select every single div. And it's only going to select the divs inside of my card. As you can see, it selects this div here. While these other divs with the class of title, those ones are staying green. And that's because I have this overarching title green class being applied to them. So this almost demonstrates a little bit of why you want to have this scoping because if this H1 here was inside of a scope, let's just create a class, we'll just call it scope. It doesn't really matter what the name is. We'll put that inside of there. And now we can scope this to be within that scope. And now you can see that that title style is now no longer leaking out and all of these are changed to red just like I would expect them to be. And you don't have to worry as much about specificity when you do something like this. Now this is really great and you're probably wondering, well, what is different about this than the other style of just doing dot card followed by the title? Well, there's a couple differences. One difference that you can see inside of this is that it doesn't change your specificity. For example, this still has the same specificity as it did before, which is why when I did it before, this title green color was overwriting this. While if I changed it to be where I just had dot card followed by my div like this, now you can see that these are all red. And that's because this has a specificity of one class, one element, while this has a specificity of one class. So obviously this is more specific. If we go back to this scoped version here though, the scope does not take into account any specificity. So this has a selector specificity of just one element, which is less specific than this title here, which is a class. Now that's a lot of complicated stuff, but essentially scoping doesn't change your specificity, which is one huge benefit. Another really big benefit is you can actually limit where your scoping ends. So let's change this back to title here. So my titles are going to be red here, but I want to say, you know what? I only want to do things that are inside my card that are not inside of a body. I want to end the scope at the body element. Well, I can do that by just saying two, and then in parentheses mention where I want to end this. So I want to end this at the body. Now you can see that this body title has changed back to the text of green. And that's because this scope only lasts for everything that's inside of a card, but not inside of a body. So it's a really good way to scope different things inside of a particular subset of elements, which I really love. Now, the thing that I think takes this to the next level and makes it really useful in frameworks is you can actually remove this from your normal style tag here, a script tag, and instead embed it directly in your code. For example, I can say that I wanna have a style tag here, and inside of here, I'm going to have an at scope, and I'm not going to specify anything for the scope. And then we'll say here, title is going to be red. Now you can see what's happening is essentially when you do a scope with nothing specified as the scope, it looks at the parent element, the element that's above this style tag, and it uses that as the scope. So we're using this card element as our scope. 
So everything inside of that card is going to be using these scoped classes right here, which is really, really cool. And we can do the same thing where I can say, you know, to the body. So that way the body elements aren't affected by this scope. And this combined with some of your normal CSS and JS kind of stuff that you're using in React and Svelte and Vue is a really great way to have this implemented directly in CSS without having a bunch of JavaScript stuff handling it all for you. Now, unfortunately, browser support for this is pretty abysmal. If we look at the page here, you can see the support is essentially 0%. It's only supported in the newest version of Chrome. So I'm using the Chrome Canary version on the absolute brand new version. And that's why I'm able to get this to work. But everywhere else, it's not supported. But hopefully, it'll come to browsers relatively soon. I think it's a pretty cool feature. Now this next CSS concept is quite a bit simpler and best of all, it's actually really well supported in browsers. As you can see, it's at 86.8%. Essentially it's supported in pretty much every major browser as you can see, which is really great. And that is an extension to the nth child selector. So we know for a fact that we can select the nth child. So here I have a list of elements, as you can see down here. And what I'm doing is I'm getting the fifth element and crossing it off with a line through it. As you can see, this fifth element has a line through it, relatively straightforward. I'm also here trying to select the second element with the special class and put a line through that. You'll notice this element doesn't have a line through it. That's because of the way that nth child works. What this code right here is actually doing is it's saying inside of my list, I want to get a special element and I want to get the second element. So what it's saying is I only will cross out an element if it's the special element and it also happens to be the second element in the list. It's not getting the second element of that special class. It's getting the second element that also has that special class. As you can see, if I change this to four, you can now see it works because it's getting the fourth element and that fourth element must also have the special class. But how do we get it to actually select the second element with that particular class? Well, to do this, what we need to do is just do our normal selector to get the second element. As you can see, that crosses off the second element here. But what we can do is we can add in here this of property and then we can specify a selector, for example, dot special. And now when I save, you can see it's actually crossing off the second element with that specific selector. So the way that this is working is all we're doing is we're saying, hey, I wanna get whatever my nth child is, you know, this could be like 2n, 2, 2n two, plus three, any combination of nth child stuff that you would normally write. And then you just give it the word of, followed by any selector you want. This could be as complicated or as simple as you want the selector be. In my case, it's just a simple class selector. And now it's going to select the second element of that class. If I change it to three, you can now see it's crossing off the third element of that class. And four will finally cross off the last element with that class. This is a great way to select elements based on different selectors. Now, one particular use case for this is a table. So I'm just gonna change up my code here. I actually have this example. I'm just gonna uncomment all this code so we can actually see what's going on. There we go, as you can see, we have this table on the right and I'll get rid of all of this code because I actually have a separate style tag to show you what's going on inside of here. So this table is just a relatively standard table and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give it some striping. So you can see every even child, I'm giving this background color. But the problem is I have the ability to hide a table row, and all hiding a table row does is add the class of hidden, which just gives it a display of none. So it's still in the DOM, it just doesn't show up. So when I click on hide, you can see the striping in my table gets messed up. It now goes a white row followed by gray followed by gray. Instead, I want to essentially stripe every other row that is visible. So we can again use that of selector here. I can say of, and I want to get all the elements that are not hidden. So I can just use a selector, the not selector, to get all the elements that aren't hidden. Now when I give this a save and I hide a row, you can see my striping reflects what these different changes are. So when I hide something, you can see all the striping gets updated throughout the entire rest of the table, which is really, really cool. Now this next CSS property is one that's really common whenever you're working with text in like a book format, and that's when you wanna make this first letter extra large. This is something that's been around in CSS forever, but there's a new feature being added that makes it easier to work with. For example, I can select the first letter of any section of text that I want, and I can change the classes on it. For example, I can make the font size larger or the color red. Now one downside to doing things this way though, is if I increase my font size, you notice it gives me this weird gap at the page here after my first line. That's because when you have a really large font, you can see that the space below that font increases drastically compared to these other letters that have a much smaller space below them. And that's because the font is larger. So instead of directly changing the font size, you can instead use the brand new initial letter property. So this initial letter property, it has really good browser support. If you look at this, it may seem like the browser support is bad. It's at 86% right now. The reason it looks like it's bad is because initial letter includes two things. It includes this initial letter property as well as initial letter align and no browser supports the align property yet, but almost all of them support this initial letter property. So the browser support is quite good. But what this lets you do is define two different properties. 
The first one is how large you want the letter to be. If I want it to be three lines of text, I can set this to three. Now you can see this letter takes up exactly three lines of text. There's no weird spacing going on. It just takes up three full lines of text. The second property determines how many lines I want to offset this by. So if I say one, you can see that this line is going to show up on the first line of text. So the bottom of this is on the first line. If I change it to two, the bottom of it is going to be on the second line. If I change it to five, you can see the bottom of this is on the fifth line of my text. So it allows me to offset this vertically, as well as determine the actual size of my font based on how many lines I want it to take up. This is really cool since, again, it doesn't mess with your spacing and it gives you much more flexibility to give you the exact styles you want. If you just pass it one letter, it's going to use the same value for the first and second property. So it's going to be three lines tall and start on the third line. Now this next property is something I'm super excited for and actually ties into my favorite property, which I have at the very end of this video. But this property essentially allows you to animate things that change the display property. So here I have some really simple code where I have a button that allows me to toggle a card. You can see when I click this, it's toggling the card to show and hide itself. And then I have my card here, which just has some basic styles. The important styles are that by default, my opacity is set to zero. My transition is set to a opacity of one second, so it'll transition over one second. My display here, you can see, is set to none. Also, when I show this element, the display is set to block and the opacity is set to one. If I come over to here in the side of the JS code, you can just see when I click on the button, I'm toggling that show class to hide and show this element. Now, the problem is you'll notice I don't get any animation at all. When I click on this, it just shows up. There's no animation of it slowly fading in and fading out. And that's because when you change something from display none to display block or any other display property, this is called a discrete value inside of CSS. It's either a value of like 0, 1, true, false. You cannot animate between those because it's either yes or no. There's no maybe in between. So since you can't animate between display none and display block, it just shows up immediately. So there's no time for it to transition between your different properties. But there's a new CSS feature you can add that essentially tells you, hey, when something just appears like the display property goes from none to block, I want some starting styles to be applied that I can do transitions or animations from. So all we do is we say at starting hyphen style. And then inside of here is where we define our starting styles. So what I can do is I can say, okay, when this thing appears for the first time, essentially, I want the opacity to be zero. Now, if I give this a save and I toggle this, you can notice I get that fade in effect because my starting style is saying, hey, start this out with an opacity of zero. Now, when I toggle it to go away, it's disappearing without doing any opacity fading, which is a bit of a bummer. That's actually a feature that is coming soon. It's just not currently in any browser right now. And the way that you would get that fade out feature to work is that browsers are adding the ability for you to essentially fake an animation on a display property. So inside of my transition, I can add a transition for my display property for one second now. And what this essentially does is it says, keep my display property as is until the one second elapses and then swap it back to what it would be transitioning to, which gives you a chance for all of your opacity transitions and so on to actually take effect. So here when I toggled this, essentially my display property would be animating to this point. And then when I toggle it back, the display property would stay shown until that one second elapses and then it would disappear. To show you an idea of what that looks like, they actually have a blog article on the Chrome developer blog that shows you this in progress. As you can see here, we have some code. I'll zoom it in a little bit so it's easier to see. We have our starting styles here inside of the open section of our popover, which spoiler alert is part of what the next thing I'm going to be talking about is. So you can see here it has this opacity and this translate. Then we have our open state, what this should look like when it's open. The opacity now is one. And then we have here these styles, which are being applied to this settings popover right here, which is like the parent class, the thing before it is open. And you can see that that's showing up fine. And then most importantly, we have that animate on the display property. Now this isn't just supported in any browsers, but you can see what this looks like in this video. You can see when they click around, there's an animate out and an animate in animation happen. There's no JavaScript at all. All of this is being handled by this CSS code right here. Also, some fun fact, you'll notice that they have nesting inside of here. CSS nesting is actually a feature that's very well supported across most browsers, and I already have a video covering it. I'll link it in cards and description if you're interested in learning how to do nesting inside of your CSS. Now this last CSS concept is by far my favorite and I think it'll revolutionize how we write CSS and JavaScript and it's almost three concepts in one. It is the popover concept, the anchor concept, and the position fallback concept which all work really well together. Now browser support for these is pretty lackluster except for the popover API that actually has decent support but not super great yet but overall it's going to be a little while till you can start to use these. The best way for me to show you what this is like is just showing you this example. This code on the right has absolutely no JavaScript at all. This is all the code there is just CSS and HTML. So I can toggle this to open up a pop-up menu. 
and I can open up another pop-up menu. And best of all, if my size of my browser changes, you can see that the actual position of these pop-up menus is changing based on where they have room to fit inside of my browser. This is something that used to require tons of JavaScript and is now just able to be done in CSS, which is absolutely mind blowing. Now I have a full video covering everything about the popover API, the anchor API, and the position fallback API, which is how you make this possible. I'll link it in the cards and description as well as the end of this video for you. But I wanna really quickly just go over kind of the overall high level basics of how this works. The very first thing that we have here is the popover API, and this happens in your HTML code. So if you want an element to be able to pop up, you give it this popover attribute. That's going to hide the element by default. For example, this nav right here is the one that shows up whenever I click on this button right here. So by default, this entire nav is hidden when you give it this popover attribute. And to be able to toggle it open and closed, you need to take a button and give it a popover target that points to the ID of the popover element you want to open. So in this case, I have a button that points to this nav menu, which is set to a popover. So when I click on this button, it's going to open the menu. And when I click it again, it closes it. Or when I click outside of it, you can see it closes. So that's the entire idea behind this popover API. Next, I want to talk about the anchor API. So what we can do is we can talk about that. And the anchor API essentially allows you to link multiple elements together. So this code is a little bit complicated, but I'll just kind of give you the high level overview. As you can see here, we can specify an anchor name and we just give it any name that we want. So we have three different anchors being set up in this case, and an anchor name is just set on an element. So for example, our context navigation, which is just this menu right here, we're anchoring it to our context button. So it's anchored to this button right here. Same thing here, when we open up our playlist, it's given the anchor name of playlist. So it's anchoring itself to this context menu. So as you can see, when I move it around, it always positions itself next to the parent menu that it's anchored to by these anchor names. Then if we scroll down a little ways, you'll see here in this position fallback section, which I'll talk about in a second, we have these top and left properties that we are defining based on the position in the anchor. So we're saying, you know what, this is going to be positioned at the top of the element that it's anchoring to, or it's going to be positioned to the right of the element it's anchored to. So in this case, you can see that the left hand property of this is set to the right side of whatever it's anchored to, which is what this looks like right here. If I just expand my screen a little bit more, there we go. You can see the left hand side of this playlist is anchored to the right hand side of the thing that it's inside of. And now the final step here is how we get it to move around. So as you can see, when my browser shrinks, it moves to this side. And that's because of this position fallback. Essentially, we're saying, hey, try all of these different positions. In our case, we're trying to put it on the left hand side first, and that doesn't work. And then we try a different thing on the left, and that still doesn't work. And then finally, we're like, let's try putting it on the right. And okay, that works. So we're going to go with that position. It allows you to try all these different positions before finding the one that actually works and then sticking with it, which is something I really love and something you used to have to write a ton of JavaScript code for. Now, if this anchor concept interests you, I highly recommend checking out the full video linked right over here. It goes majorly in depth on everything you need to know about this. Also, if you want to learn even more amazing CSS features you've probably never heard of, I have a bunch of videos just like this one. I'm going to link the very first one right over here. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.